we are so honored to have Dustin Kelly this evening for our nutshell. Um, Dustin founded Autumn Berry Inspired in 2012 to explore alternative approaches to controlling autumn olive shrubs. He created a business to harvest, process, market, and distribute this delicious and abundant resource. For the past six years, Dustin has been developing efficient ways to harvest the fruit from wild terrain, and he loves sharing what he's discovered with others, like tonight during this nutshell, <laughs> uh, hoping to inspire widespread foraging and consumption of autumn berries. Um, and also a fun little fact, proud to be a new dad, <laughs> so especially thanks for taking the time this evening. Um, so with that, I will uh, switch presenters here. Okay. So um, yeah, well, welcome everybody. Uh, Nicole Kelly, uh, this is a special intimate meeting talking about autumn berries. Um, I'm not a stranger to small classes. I was a, um, a free uh, yoga teacher where I taught free classes, and sometimes only one person would come. And two people would come, and sometimes that's the most special time. So um, what I really want to share with everybody today is a little bit about what I've learned from my years working with autumn berries. Um, so autumn berries are special for me. I first came across them six years ago growing on an organic farm that I was working at, and I realized that they were a valuable resource, so I started to create a company from them. So before we start, just a moment of reflection to think about landscapes and what functions should natural landscapes perform? What do they for? What makes a la landscape natural? What motivates people to interact with natural areas? A park, a farm, private property, public property. What is an invasive species? Something different to everybody. There's of course official laws that have been in the books about what invasive species is, but there's nothing really um, biological that is ex that is clearly determines what invasive species is. And why are they a problem? What do they do? How do people react to invasive species? And what could be a more ideal way for us to cohabitate with them? These are some of the questions that, that I reflected on over the years, and hopefully I've learned a, well, I can share a little bit of what I've learned. Um, first, what is an autumn berry? Well, autumn berry is a wild, plentiful, nutritious, non-toxic, and delicious food resource. It is delicious, uh, it is plentiful, <laughs> and they grow all across the northeastern United States, they grow in Asia, and they grow in India and a few places, maybe Pakistan. Well, so what is an autumn berry though? Well, it's the fruit of the autumn olive, which is in Latin, Eleagnus umbellata, the shrub from Asia. It was intentionally introduced in the United States in the 1940s to 1980s. It was used particularly for land conservation, mine, mine restoration, and windbreaks on farms. The conservationists love to grow tens of thousands of these bushes and give them away to farmers to put along their hedgerows. And from there, they spread. The birds would eat the tasty fruit and spread them throughout the open areas, and they sort of naturalized with such a genetic um, foundation, they were able to naturalize in the new world and become quite aggressive, quite invasive. So what does my company do? Well, my company makes products. We make jam in three varieties. We have original, jalapeno, and habanero. That's these guys over here. Uh, this is our third version of the labels. Um, we're pretty happy with them. I did, local artist David Michael Moore made them. Um, Got the barcode, nutritional facts, information. They're glossy. They hold up well in the fridge. It's, we've learned a lot about packaging and labeling through this process. We make fruit leather. What is fruit leather? Fruit leather is, and you can see my small screen, right? Yeah, I think you can, right? Um, fruit leather are these little guys. They are um, dehydrated apples berries, and chia seeds. And then we top them with pumpkin seeds, flax, and some more chia seeds. These are 2.5 by 6 inches in size. They are um, about an ounce in weight. These wholesale, probably about $2, and we can they retail at about $2.50 or $3. They fit well in these little red totes. And then what else do we make? We make puree. 
puree by the pint, the quart, and the gallon. Wow, that's a gallon. Okay. What do we do with all these? Well, the jam and the fruit leather go retail onto shelves, and the, ga the puree, we put the pints on some shelves, and then we also have the gallons and quarts for sale to other businesses because we love collaboration. From the beginning, I always felt that one of the best ways to get people to know about autumn berries to get it to be eaten in more ways was to collaborate with other food businesses that were already established. So the thing is, you can make almost anything with autumn berries. You can make ice cream. Anything you make strawberries with or raspberries into, you can make with autumn berries. So um, whipped cream makes a cupcake. Um, donuts. You can make a sauce. There's a nice savory element to autumn berries, so you can make barbecue sauces, salad dressings, a variety of things. Um, so we supplied ingredients to other companies. So I, a little, there's my photo. Here I am out there, the berries. I found these five acres, and I realized this is the start. These trees are already growing here. They're plentiful. They're really productive. Uh, I went ahead and started harvesting them. After a few years, I was up to harvesting uh, 6,000, 10,000 pounds in a season. And when I, by a season, I mean about 10 days to about two to three weeks of harvesting. So the harvest period in any region, in any latitude, could be up to maybe a month. There's sort of a peak time when there's the best time to get it. And then even a little bit later, the berries, the trees don't all ripen at the same time. They're all genetically different. So you'll see some trees come on early, and then the birds will get some of those, and then a little bit later some more trees will come on. And you just sort of learn in your environment when's the best time to go out and get them. Um, ABI, from the beginning, was always a company with a mission, to educate and restore. We feel that by promoting widespread consumption of the fruit, it can help us accomplish our ecological mission, which is to transform land to establish new ways of cohabitating with a super plentiful resource. Rather than treating it as an enemy, rather than treating it as something we have to hate and fight, why not learn to tame it to some degree? Sometimes I would give the analogy of the, of the, the Native Americans and the buffalo. The Native Americans saw giant herds of buffalo. They didn't say, wow, that's the enemy. Look at them, just trampling across everything. We, we, we need to poison them. No, they, they learned to, that there was a resource that they could get so much off of. Uh, so in the same way, autumn berries are like those buffalo, just rampaging across our landscapes, and, but much more gently, much more quietly. Um, and they are something that is there for us to go get. If when we go get it, we can create for-profit businesses, those for-profit businesses feed back to create more consumption. This is the little five acres on uh, at the organic farm in Urbana. Uh, it's great because if you look at Google Maps of a terrain where you know there might be some auto berries, you can pretty well identify them. Once you get to know, once you see them in person and then look at Google Maps, you can see what the contour, what the color of the canopy looks like. Then you can get on Google Maps and map it out and get an estimate of about how much you know is there. Uh, an autumn olive grove can be kind of dense and hard to penetrate, so sometimes it's hard to really make your way in. But if you can see it from Google Maps, you might get a good idea of how much you're talking about. I People say, oh, so you just go all across the county picking the autumn berries? Uh, no, that's, that, that's one way to do it, but that's not my way to do it. It's not the most efficient way. I, I want to approach this from a business point of view, meaning I want efficiency, I want scalability, I want reliability. So I want to work with just a few pieces of land and get to know those lands very well. And I believe in doing that, we're going to improve those lands. Because in order to get to more of the fruit, you need to create avenues. You need to create lanes. So this little picture kind of shows the concept that if you took that terrain and as you go, you cut through either with loppers, chainsaws, or bulldozers, you're eventually going to have avenues 
that you can go up and down, which means you're going to have more edge area, which is where the fruit will be growing, so you can increase your yield from a wild area. Now again, this is not land that anybody planted. This is land that the birds planted 15 or 20 years ago, and it just happened to be in somebody's backyard that I had access to. So we turned that into that into a wild orchard. So by picking the autumn berries, um, my little, there we go. I'm going to move my little viewer over there. Doing that improves the forest health. And we can then plant cover crops through those avenues and around the areas. We can plant more crops, we can plant native plants, we can plant native bushes, we can put beehives, and eventually transform a wild, um, unlikable area into a forest garden. In doing that, we're creating a multifunctional landscape, a landscape that benefits us, benefits people, and benefits the ecology, including the animals, the birds, the insects, and even the nutrient flows, uh, through many different ways. So public parks have a great social aspect, but they're really low on economy. They don't produce much food or, or anything for people. They also involve a lot of grass, so they aren't that great for the environment. Um, a production, agriculture production may be great for the economy, but it's not a place where many people go to hang out unless there is, it's just sort of an agritourism place. And it's also not that great for the environment always. So somewhere here, a natural forest garden could be towards the center of this triangle where we have a lot of some benefit. It doesn't max out the economy, doesn't max out the social or the environmental, but it's good all around. This is the 30 acres where we started. And on this, there's about five acres of autumn olive. So again, they are edible. They also have a lot of lycopene. They are nutritional. They have a, they are a superfood. Autumn berries have a lot of lycopene, 17 times as much lycopene as tomatoes. And they're pretty popular. Once I started to look around online, a lot of people across the country like them, know them, eat them, harvest them, make them into mead, wine, beer, uh, make fruit leather, make jams. At one point, the uh, Illinois... Uh, Department of Conservation was promoting the idea of going and harvesting autumn berries and making your own jam. And But overall, it's pretty wasted. Most of the fruit goes to waste. Um, it is spread throughout, like I said, most of the northeast. I don't know of it much down in the south. The map here shows it in Florida, Louisiana. I've not heard much of it around there. Mostly I hear of it in the northeast and the midwest. Okay, so has a lot of good things to it. It creates wildlife food habitat. It's tasty for humans. It's high in lycopene. It's a nitrogen fixer, another benefit. Uh, it's drought resistant. It's really hard to kill these things. And they help uh, control erosion. On the downside, they can invade. They can create a monoculture. They outcompete natives. And the birds spread the seeds, and you can't really stop them. Uh, and nothing eats the leaves. There's, they're not really a, well, except for ruminants. Uh, goats, uh, goats, sheep, pigs will love to eat this bush, especially goats. Okay. So what I saw was a missed opportunity. Here is a resource growing around North America. Meanwhile, we're importing all these exotic superfoods to make into relatively unpleasant beverages and products that the um, the more wealthy classes consume that are just really expensive. Goji, mangosteen, noni, acai, these are wildly expensive. And why? Because they're rare, because they're imported. Meanwhile, we have a fruit growing here that is as good or better than any of these exotic superfoods. So the standard approach is to cut down everything on invaded land, bulldoze it in a big pile, burn it, spray it with herbicide, plant native prairie, corn or soybeans. Most of the time it's corn or soybeans because that's who's got the money. And then return every year to fight the saplings when birds drop them from neighboring properties. Sometimes because they are an undesirable species, things are just cut down and let to grow back and they grow right back as another field of autumn berries and never stop fighting. It just goes on and on a cycle. So the autumn berry approach is to prune them and harvest the fruit while we prune. Plant native tr plants and trees, including oak trees, uh, currant bushes, hazelnuts, chestnuts, 
over time, the oak trees will shade out the autumn olives because they don't grow very well in the shade. The land becomes a mature forest in which the autumn olives don't grow. And then we move on to new, new jungle, improving new landscapes and just basically finding new areas to harvest from. Who are these landowners who have large areas of this? Farmers, mining corporations, national forests, state forests, county parks, Departments of Transportation, um, they grow widely along the highways. Uh, the trains, they grow widely along the train tracks and the clear areas around train tracks. Um, and reclamation efforts. Here in, here in our area, there's uh, a lot of efforts to take these old railways and make them into multifunctional parks and um, bike paths. So who else benefits? Local food producers have a new ingredient to play with. Local consumers get a healthy, tasty new food that can be very affordable. Uh, seasonal workers benefit because late in the season it gives people an extra food to eat. I made this PowerPoint a little while ago talking about migrant worker children. It was a different atmosphere back then. Um, but there's somebody, there, that's, a, that's a group of people I really sympathize with. Um, there's migrant people who are picking so much of the food. And they're out there through the summers working with the corn and soy. And at some point, they there's no work for them up here, so then they head south. Um, autumn berries growing up north through the fall could give them some food to eat, some, some work, while the children can stay in school before they end up moving. And unemployed people, like kids, recovering drug, drug addicts, felons, all that I've employed, all of them. And they, we've all had a good time. It's a short time, um, each harvest is only about two or three weeks, but generally anybody who's able-bodied can get out there and do it. So what about the wildlife? It's fantastic for them because what you're doing is taking something that is useful for them, a wild thicket, but you're thinning it out. You're reducing the excess of this one species. We're by, how are we doing that? We're pruning them back. We're making the canopy smaller because we, add, we prune and harvest at the same time. So it's transformed into a more accessible, diverse, productive area. What can we make? Like I said, we can make um, an ingredient like the puree. We can make jams and other branded products. And we can also make food supplements like, uh, like lycopene. So the three steps. How, do you, how can I harvest autumn berries? Three steps to it. Land reclamation, harvesting the fruit, and processing and storing the fruit. So we'll go through a little bit of that. This is a, the first, our process starts with cutting a branch full of berries. Now that sounds a little, um, may not sound like the way you, you'd expect. You don't, with most trees, an apple tree, you don't take and cut the branch because the apple tree will take a long time to grow back. With autumn berries, there's so many of them and the trees grow back so quickly that you might as well just cut off a whole branch. We pile the branches on tarps. We drag the tarps to a shaking station, which you'll see in a second. Hold the branch, hit it with a beater stick, throw the branch onto a pile, a waste pile, and in the catching bill, thin the ca fill the catching bin up to about four to five inches, and then replace that bin with new bags. Put the bags of filled with berries in the shade, of course. So what about over, harvest, over pruning? You can't really. Even if you did this to a little patch of trees, it's going to be okay because some of them will die, some of them will grow back. This area that we're working with is about 10 or 15 acres of autumn berries. It's okay. We can go on and get more. Uh, Two-inch loppers work the best. Um, you can take down a pretty good branch with that. Building a shaking station with poles, tape, and um, uh, pull ties, you make basically this. First way to do it is just to put a tarp on the ground and shake on that. But by doing this, creating a, a platform, a ramp that the berries can go down, you can make it, um, you can funnel the berries to the, to the bin. Uh, you can get a, a, sh a beating stick by cutting an autumn berry branch to about 12, 14 inches long. By hitting them together, it takes the bark off, which makes them smoother and easier to hit. So you take the branch and hit it. You can have groups of kids come over. Uh, these are college, college kids from the university, um, and they picked it up very fast.
here's some of the workers out there filling the, filling the bins. Um, and some numbers for that. Basically, we could get about 18 pounds per, per person, per hour. So through a day with five people, 18 pounds, five hours, you can get about, um, about 400, 500 pounds to process them. Um, the neat thing about autumn berries is the, the, the berries will sink and everything else floats. So if you put them into a colander, you can remove them. Um, you can remove everything that floats. You can remove the sticks and the leaves, um, the spiders. You can get all of that out. The second step, which is if you're going to go bigger, you need a winnower. A winnower is a blueberry. Usually a blueberry winnower works well. It blows, blows the air through the, through the product and re really cleans it out pretty well. After that, you'll want to freeze the berries, packing them into one-gallon Ziploc bags. You can get a five pounds in that, or you can put them in a four-gallon food pail or a five-gallon bucket. And this is, us. this is us on the line. Out in Danville, we'd fill the bins. We'd fill bags. We'd put those in about two or three into a bin. We don't want them to smash each other, so that we put more bins on top of each other and then tie it all down. We took those to Decatur, and then here's our winnower line. There's the berries going up the winnower. And oh, I don't have a good picture of the blowing. But anyway, they go up the winnower, they're blown out, then they go on the inspection table, and then they go into the buckets. To puree it, on a small scale, you can use a colander. You can use a chinua or a food mill. Um, but on a large scale, you can use a pulper finisher. A pulper finisher is this big, expensive machine. And if you can find one of those at a local co-packer. My co-packer is Country Kettle in Ava, Illinois. He's fantastic. It's James Yoder. Anybody within four or five hours of them who wants to co-pack, I'd really recommend it because he can do jams, butters, um, salsas, barbecue sauces. Uh, we made our jams in the beginning, and we found that working with a co-packer was much better. Um, and then you can also juice them. You can juice autumn berries with a steam juicer, which basically lets the berries squeeze out their juice, and it's fantastic. And I've got a short movie. This is a good time to switch over, and let's see whether or not the movie works. Okay. Hello, I'm Dustin Kelly, founder of Autumn Berry Inspired. I'd like to share with you some of my favorite ways to process autumn berries. The simplest way to turn autumn berries into a smooth, seedless puree is to cook the berries in a pan with a little water. After the berries have softened, you can put them through a food mill to remove the seeds. Then you can continue to cook the puree and add other ingredients. You can make a sweet or savory sauce, or add pectin to make a jam. You can use the puree in any way that inspires you. Get juice from autumn berries. I've found the mechanical juices with blades tend to smash the seeds to make a fiber-filled puree instead of juice. However, I've had good success with a Mehulika steam juicer. To use a steam juicer, Fill the bottom pan with water, layer the fruit and sugar in the fruit basket, steam until you get a good amount of juice. Just don't let the bottom pan boil dry. We at Autumn Berry Inspired have developed a process to efficiently make fruit leather using minimal equipment. To make our Autumn Berry fruit leather bars, we use Autumn Berry puree, frozen aronia berries, honey, applesauce, lemon juice, chia seeds, and pumpkin seeds. Basically, the fruit leather process has two parts, combining the ingredients into a smoothie, then spreading that smoothie into thin and sheets. Depending on the humidity, we dehydrate the sheets for about 13 hours. We hope this 
video inspires you to harvest your own autumn berries and to make your own tasty and nutritious juice, jam, and fruit leather from this plentiful wild resource. To learn more about our products and how our approach helps reduce the spread of an invasive species, visit www.autumnberryinspired.com. Okay, so there's the movie. I just want to check in with everybody. Is this every everybody still still hearing this and everything? It's weird not to have any feedback. All right, Kelly gives us a cool. Who else do we have here? Nicole still here, and Linda. Fantastic. All right, well let's get back over to the PowerPoint. We have. Pretty close to the end, and it looks like we're getting close to our time for my presentation, and then we'll have uh, some QA time. So here's where I pitch you to copy my model, <laughs> because really, you know what would really make this whole thing a lot more fun is some competition. I would love to have people around the country. That's really what Autumnberry Inspired was set to do, was to inspire widespread use of it. So on one hand, it'd be great if I created a company and then some giant food company came by and said, that's a good idea. We're buying that for millions of dollars. But that's not so likely to happen in the big picture. Um, in the more likely better outcome could be that people around the country say, wow, that's a good idea. I could do that in my own area, creating my own products and selling them to my local stores. I could get local media to cover them. I could get local newspapers and radio to, to do it. I could get out there and find bloggers on the internet to make stories about me and do basically what Dustin did as a feature of their small farm, of their agritourism efforts, or their large farm. Maybe somebody with a 500 acres of corn and 100 acres of autumn berries could take that 100 acres of autumn berries and really create a lot of healthy, nutritious food for people. So what I would suggest is to copy me, find autumn berries in your area, create an autumn berry paradise, reclaim the land, take the land from just being invaded and wasted and make it lovable, make it accessible, um, give tours of it, create um, fire pits, create camping spots, have activity there, plant other plants there, plant flowers in your lanes and make some appreciation of this tree because once you start to appreciate what's there, it's, it, comes, it comes so easily. Um, it's a wide open market, your only competitor is me and I'm happy to share with you. Um, or we can collaborate, use some of my recipes and just, just let's, let's do it. <laughs> I'm willing to share recipes, technologies, buy or sell fruit with you, uh, buy or sell products, act as a consultant, um, act as a marketing advisor. So, um, Agritourism is also a good way to go. People like to visit farms and by using autumn berries, it shows that you're kind of on the underutilized resource. It's a, on the, you're on the cutting edge of the green homesteading movement. Uh, what is What's greener than standard agriculture? Organic agriculture. What's better than organic? Local organic. What's better than local organic? Wild. So by using a wild product, a wild resource, you're really as good as it gets. Harvesting your land will help your land because your land will be better. You'll look better. You'll have more access to more places. And you'll also have a new environment to plant crops, raise livestock. Like I said, chickens, goats, ducks, everybody can live within an autumn berry uh, food forest. Um, people like to visit it. It's the Invasive Species Task Force, people like to see what you're doing. Uh, park districts, uh, teachers, students, gardening groups, herb societies. So to thin out or clear one acre of land, five work, to clear one acre of land, five workers, 20 hours, about $1,000, oops, yeah, to prune it, 
to to clear it and prepare it about a thousand dollars. Um, that's with a harvest. Uh, okay. What do you need to do? You need loppers, handsaw, work pants, gloves, eye protection. Um, an acre of autumnberry orchard may have 200 to 400 trees. Each tree may yield 10 to 20 pounds of fruit. That yields 2,000 to 8,000 pounds of fruit. With manual harvest method, our workers can get about 15 pounds in an hour. So this our harvest is 130 to 530 paid hours or between $1,300 to $5,300 to harvest it. The tools are very simple, sticks, tarps, bins. Um, you could sell them to me possibly for $2 a pound, or you can add value yourself and get much more. You can get $6 a pound or so when you're adding your own value and using your own resources. Okay. So I've got a few. OK, so then the topic of get, of course, was what else I learned. So I learned something about how to scale wild foraging because I'd never really seen anybody doing something like that. So I kind of had to reinvent it myself. I had to learn what is it to get something. And then auto berries are wonderful to scale because there's so much of them. Scaling um, wild cherries is much harder because they are fewer and farther between. I learned a lot about processing and kitchen food safety. I learned about product development, one of my favorite parts. I learned about pitching your concept and also sales pitches. I learned what the investor world is and what they have to offer. Um, I never went and took a giant um, investment from somebody because I, I didn't want the company to have to be burdened by that. I didn't want to be burdened by a giant debt to repay. So basically, we just bootstrapped the whole thing. Retail and distribution is a tricky world. It's you may have a wonderful product. You may have uh, customers. It's, stores generally love what you want to do. You, a small farmer, uh, doing anything you're doing in the Savannah Institute, in the uh, permaculture world, they like to get your products if they are good. But distribution is tricky because a distribution company wants a lot and they want um, they'll take a big chunk of the of the price as well. Okay. Um, last things to show. What did I have? I had this little guy, which is kind of a neat. This is a little movie of shaking the bushes. It's a nice relaxing process. <laughs> And um, here's a screenshot of our harvest area. Uh, our first harvest area was there in Urbana. This one is in near Danville. And this is a much larger area. It's on a state forest park preserve. Um, this is a tree research area that was planted back in the 70s. There's a lot of mature walnuts, hickories, butternuts, all sorts of trees. And I believe they probably planted autumn berries in between them and then thinned them out. That was a common practice back then. Over years, this whole area over here became quite filled with autumn berries and a variety of other trees. And then this is a big empty field over there, which is quickly becoming uh, filled. It's quickly becoming bathed with autumn berries. All right. Um, that's, that's all I've got to share for myself. So now I'd love to hear your questions and comments. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dustin. Um, this is Kelly again. For those, we've had a couple others join us over the, the course of the, your talk. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start the Q&A now. And it's, so in the meantime, I'll start it off, Dustin. I am, uh, yeah, I, I have so many questions. Fascinating sort of endeavor that you've, you've uh, gone down here. I w I'd like to know more about the oak trees that you, you know, you said you, uh, will plant oak trees in that in that grove and over time they'll shade out and and then you'll move on to the next the next source of autumn berries is that sort of in the long run uh, how do you see that like impacting your business <laughs> so i started all this not owning any land and i still don't own any land and yet i have access to these trees how do I do that? I do that by treating the landowners as my as my 
customers. I'm there, I'm there to receive something from them, but also to serve them. So it kind of comes to what are the desires of the landowners, of the stakeholders. For most people, they would desire the trees to not be there. So if that's the plan, if that's their, their hope, then I want to shape my business and my procedure to get them what they want. And so I think that's about one of the best if, – if this is a, a short-term process, well, in order to align myself with the wider intentions of, of environmentalists, of conservationists, and people concerned about the environment in general, what we do needs to have a reduction, elimination aspect to Autoberry Inspired. We can't farm the species in most states. In most states, it would be, it would be illegal. Um, so instead, we only will harvest from wild areas. Harvesting from wild areas, we, we would want to reduce down what's there so that we can show that we've done a productive thing to the land and replace it with trees and species that can be farmed. So that's, that's how I've always sort of conceived of Autumnberry, is it's a, it's a way to utilize what's here. And since what's here is not ideal because it is exotic, aggressive, it's not exactly the species that should be here, I also want to appreciate the species for what it's doing. It's fixing nitrogen, it's feeding the birds, and it can feed us. And yet I want to gently transfer over to other species like current hazelnut chestnut. That's one of the things that really got me so excited about Savannah Institute is how Savannah Institute looks at broad areas, usually stand, uh, conventional agriculture, corn and soy, and turns those into food forests, into perennial uh, polyculture food farms. But I was also wondering what happens when you work with invaded land? What, what happens when you work with land that has no commercial productivity yet? And what if a way to hack that system was to utilize the autumn berries and reduce them down as you transfer them over to other, other trees? So that's, that's basically the long answer. Well, I've got one more question. Sure. <laughs> well, well, those are, um, yeah, so in the video there was a, um, I'm interested in, in marketing and yes. how you, you know, your initial reflection questions, sort mm -hmm. of changing how people view the word invasive, mm -hmm. uh, the, these particular plants. There was a, a quote on some sign, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but in the video it said, since we can't beat it, let's eat it. You yeah. know, sort of this motto that you've, you've cooked up. Um, can you talk about the, how you're really shifting folks, like the consumer's idea of this invasive plant. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to shift a person's opinion, especially when somebody feels neutral about something, then moving it to positive has a certain degree of movement. But if somebody feels very negatively about something, then you've got a lot more room to move. It might be more difficult, but in the case of of these invasive foods, I think that it's I think the argument is there. I think it's possible. You see something similar happening with uh, silverfin, with Asian carp, with the the fish that are jumping out of the rivers out in um, um, in the in American rivers. The Asian fish, it's they're getting a lot of attention because people are realizing that it's it's the same thing. We can't beat it. Not well. We might. We might be able to beat Asian fish, but it's going to take a lot of consumption. A, lo a large part of consumption will be a helpful part of beating it. Um, it also goes a little bit with the the idea that it is that that make peace, make make jam, not war. Is another one we have, which is why why do we want to fight? Why do we want to treat another species as an enemy? Let's instead think of it as something that is, that is useful. Let's think of it as something that is beautiful. Let's think of it as something that is natural. I sometimes feel that when people 
in your average town get interested in in the environment this is you know people don't always have a long legacy not everybody grows up on a farm a lot of people grow up in a city disconnected from nature when they get interested in nature they go to the parks they go to the park district and they say hello I'm here I want to do something I want to help nature I just found out nature is important I want to do something to to help the natural areas and they say fantastic great well here here's what you do this is what nature is and this is what invasive is this is what is good and native and this is what is bad so these are the enemies and if you want to help you can be a soldier and here's your weapon this is your herbicide and your loppers and go to it and that's sort of the experience I feel of many people now I'm not trying to say that park districts and the fighting of the invasives is is all bad it's, it's they're not bad people and, and I respect them for for the efforts that they do and the the broad sped the changes that they make to the land but I wonder if there can be a gentler more natural way to incorporate people to to get people involved with nature and I think that learning to eat the invasives while you know that there are too many of them and we should be controlling them could be a good answer to that um, so I think that that yes from the point of view of marketing Autumnberry has a lot of that that potential there because for the first thing almost nobody that I've come across I'm probably about 70 percent have never heard of it they have no idea that there is a wild edible non-toxic fruit growing within their vicinity within their county and that they could be growing in such large populations that they could be harvested and made quite a bit of human food from most people don't know about that when they, when they hear about it they're surprised when they find out that it's invasive and that most of the time people are hating and fighting it then they're a little confused and when they see that there is another answer something else we could be doing then they're excited so that's how we really connect with people is showing them what has happened and where we can go where we will likely go if we follow the current trajectory but what else can we do what's a brighter future what is a new way to deal with the problems that will make the next generations appreciate what we've done excellent that's fascinating uh yeah i really like that sort of change maker attitude <laughs> thanks um great well i i'm not seeing any other questions typed or in the queue here right. um, so any final words from you Dustin um no I uh, well, I do mean that it is a, it is an open invitation if you if you know of autumn berries in your area and this is, goes for anybody in the video as well if um, if this is, idea is interesting to you or I'm also happy to work with anything that isn't autumn berries in fact as I've said a few times really autumn berries for me involve how to exit from autumn berries <laughs> how to because I know that really realistically autumn berries the way that I've come to do it is not really going to support it's not a lifelong income in that way it's it's a it's a helpful addition to a farm it's a new revenue stream but it it always will have the challenge of not being farmable and if it's not farmable then there isn't an investor who's going to say oh yeah let's let's go ahead and make this go fast let's make it go big so instead um, what I've learned about autumn berries what I've learned about making things with autumn berries how do we transfer that to other farmable um, widespread maybe under underutilized fruit like black currant, red currant, aronia, elderberry. That's those are sort of also where my interests are is how do we use and sell those fruits which are widely grown but underutilized and at the same time how do we even start with autumnberry land and convert it over to elderberry, currant, aronia land. Um, so that's that's also where I'm really interested. So uh, I just hope that everybody um, gets out there and, and enjoys nature 
and enjoys eating wild natural foods. Excellent. And on behalf of the Savannah Institute, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I want to remind you all that uh, this was recorded, and so we'll be sending out an email in about a week or so with, with that, um, as well as a quick little survey um, to, to see how you like these nutshells and how we might improve on them. Um, yeah, so we look forward to the next one, uh, and thank you again, Dustin. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate it, and thank you, everybody, for listening in. Okay. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.